Diva Khorja, I'm Kathleen Byrne. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second webinar of our live STEM Sawalia series brought to you by the PDST Primary STEM team. Over the next hour or so, we hope to share with you some ideas and insights into the learning opportunities that we all have in our homes that could be utilised during the challenge of distance learning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Timmons. We are really looking forward to exploring STEM and the kitchen with you over the next hour. As we are in the kitchen today, we hope you all have a nice cup of tea or coffee and maybe even a nice little, little treat too. Sit back, relax and enjoy the content we have prepared for you this morning. We are delighted with the level of interest in today's webinar, once again exceeding our expectations. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Dee Vermaden is Misha Michelle Colletty and I will be monitoring the Q&A today with my colleagues Siobhan, Dennis and Trina. We're really looking forward to hearing all of your questions. Kathleen is now going to take us through the introduction for today's webinar, and she'll also do a little bit more explaining in terms of the Q&A. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Michelle. So today, let's begin with our key messages. STEM integration means planning for rich tasks, which explore mathematics and science skills and content meaningfully rather than in a tokenistic way. Integrated STEM learning involves carefully planned activities which interweave content, skills and concepts relevant to science and maths, utilising technology and engineering opportunities. STEM learning experiences should be linked to real world contexts, where people have the opportunity to apply and develop problem solving and reasoning skills in an authentic and creative way. The primary SESE curriculum centres around the pupils' understanding and appreciation for their own local context and environment, spiralling outwards into exploration of the wider world. STEM tasks and learning experiences should provide opportunities to engage pupils in productive struggle, harnessing their natural curiosity to solve problems in the world around them. Inquiry-based and playful pedagogies can support pupil learning in STEM in all contexts and settings. Children's current understandings and existing ideas should be used as a starting point in STEM, with teachers eliciting, supporting and extending these through appropriate questioning. The 1971 primary school curriculum placed a huge emphasis on environment-based learning and activity and discovery methods. These principles were revised and again endorsed in the 99 curriculum, where a wider range of learning principles were introduced. Four of these principles can be seen in green and have helped to influence our content today, as well as the quote at the bottom of your screen. First-hand experience that actively engages the child with the immediate environment and with those who live in it is the most effective basis for learning. Today's webinar will take the following format. We will be finished the introductory session shortly, after which we will explore three different sub-themes of STEM in the kitchen. Under each sub-theme, food, working in the kitchen and liquids and change, we will examine curricular links, sample learning experiences and additional resources. We will conclude today's webinar by guiding you towards some useful resources available to schools and answering some of your questions should time permit. We would love your participation in today's webinar and this can be done in a number of ways. Throughout the hour, we will ask you to take part in numerous polls, which will appear on your screen and help us to interact with each other. If at any stage during the webinar you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our colleagues, Michelle, Trina, Dennis and Siobhan, are on hand to help answer any of your STEM queries and will endeavour to get as met to as many questions as possible. At the end of the webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation form. We have made this as short and manageable as possible and would greatly appreciate your feedback as it will help to guide us for the upcoming webinars. We have compiled a lot of resources which we will look at during this webinar including teacher friendly reference sheets and documents. These are currently being uploaded to our website and we hope to guide you towards them at the end of the webinar. Once again, please don't feel the need to write furiously during the webinar. We want you to have a pleasant learning experience and we also hope to make a recording of this webinar available to participants after the event. We might now take this opportunity to find a little bit more about the teachers joining us today, as you will see your first poll appear on the screen. Thank 
Thank you for your participation there. It's lovely to see such a wide variety of class settings represented this morning. Before we begin, let us now be mindful of the number of different children in each and every class. Not every child will have a large modern kitchen. Some might have a kitchenette, some might be living in direct provision or homeless accommodation and sharing a kitchen with others. Therefore, please consider all of your pupils when choosing appropriate tasks, not only their age and learning needs, but also their home circumstances. So now let's begin with my favorite topic, food. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, indeed, as Kathleen says, the first sub-theme we are going to explore today is food. Food plays such an important part in all of our lives, but what about the opportunities for learning? How can we use the theme of food to teach different mathematical and scientific concepts and develop skills? Food is relevant, current and relatable for children and thus provides a valuable context for learning. In this section, we have chosen three activities which you can use to explore the theme of food. Our activities are edible crystals, sink or swim, and serial investigations. If you joined us last week, you will be familiar with this layout for mapping our theme to the curriculum and to skills development. We use the Poplet app to create this image. I'll give you a moment now to examine the areas of, of the maths and science curriculum that we hope to explore today using the theme of food. We will begin looking at our first activity with a familiar, a familiar phrase from last week's webinar. I wonder. I wonder what this image is. What can you observe about this image? Providing children with magnified images of objects can give them a valuable insight into the composition of things. How often do we ask children what something would look like under a microscope? This image here was taken using the magnifying glass app which is freely available for Apple and Android devices. A lot of children may not have a magnifying glass readily available at home, but this app allows you to capture an image and zoom in and out using a slider with up to 10 times magnification. The image which appears on your screen was taken using this app and it is a magnification of a small amount of sugar. Our first activity for today is edible crystals. We had a great few days testing these at home ourselves this week. This sugar crystal science experiment is based on the principle of saturation. Sugar crystals form when you create a super saturated solution, which contains more sugar and can be dissolved by water under normal conditions. In a saturated solution, sugar molecules have a greater chance of bumping into each other because there's less space to move around. When this happens, the sugar molecules start sticking together. If we give them something to cling on to, like string or a lollipop stick, they will form even more quickly. This is what we tried to achieve in this activity. As you can see, we carried out our investigations using jam jars, lollipop sticks and string. On the night before the investigation, we wet our string and lollipop sticks and dipped them in sugar. We thought that this might help to speed up the crystals forming. The following day, we decided to try out a few different ratios of sugar and water. As can be seen on the jars on the left hand side of this slide, we chose to make a mixture of three parts sugar to one part water and also a mixture of two parts sugar to one part water. For each jar, we heated the relevant amount of cups of sugar in a saucepan alongside one cup of water and allowed them to cool slightly. We then added some food colouring and poured it into our jars with the strings and lollipop sticks suspended with a clothes peg. We placed some jars in the fridge and left others out at room temperature in order to investigate whether temperature had an effect on the final product. Day by day, we noticed our crystals growing in size until we removed them five days later and here are the results. We identified many opportunities to explore curricular areas with this activity. While the science links, in particular to the material strand, are obvious, we can extend this task further to integrate rich maths activities. 
Can we ask children to record their predictions or observations and results on a graph? Is there another way that we can record them? Can we explore surface area using our crystals? What is the best way to measure our crystals? Is the longest crystal the biggest crystal? Or maybe is the heaviest crystal the biggest crystal? Children can be encouraged to work like a scientist to explore the idea of fair testing using this particular activity. What can we change to get a different result? Can we investigate the ratio of sugar to water and will this affect change? Does the food coloring have any other effect on our results? If we use salt, for example, would we get the same result? Our friends at the School of Primary Science and Maths have a classroom pack for growing crystals. In English, Agusasquega, if you would like to explore this theme further. While our activity focused on edible crystals, why not explore different recipes and investigations? Children could make crystal decorations, crystal garden, etc. Our second activity for today in this section is sink or swim. This activity will focus on making predictions and carrying out an investigation exploring floating and sinking. Using whatever fruit and vegetables they have available to them at home, children can be encouraged to fill out this prediction sheet, which can be found on our website. Will this fruit or vegetable sink or float in water? Young children can represent their predictions pictorially, as shown. They might like to use two hula hoops to sort and classify their objects. In a moment, we will show you a short segment of a video which demonstrates this activity. During this video, you will see a number of different fruits and vegetables immersed in water. Can you make a prediction before the items are immersed? Will they sink or will they float? Let's take a look and see how our predictions differ from the results. Sink or float? Fruit. Apple. Float. Avocado. Sink. Banana. Float. Bell pepper. Float. Cherries. Sink. Children can then be encouraged to record the results and discuss how they differ from their predictions. They could use the same process to record the results, or maybe they could use a different form of data representation. This activity can help to guide children through the inquiry process with trigger questions such as, if you remove the skins, will the results change? If I cut the fruit in half, will the results change? Do big things always sink? Children, once again, can be encouraged to work like a scientist and carry out their own inquiries, applying what they have learned, helping them to make connections. The Science Sparks website, which is referenced here and once again at the end of this section, has a lovely extension activity called Fruit Boats. It encourages children to work scientifically to design small boats using thick skin from a variety of fruit make predictions, and then test which one floats best. This would build nicely on the design and make activity from last week's webinar, where we made a raft from natural materials. Our final activity in this section is based around an activity taken from the PDST measures manual, where pupils are challenged to use the design and make process to make a breakfast cereal box. The activity requires pupils to fulfill certain criteria which can be altered to suit age and ability. 
Within the task in the measures manual, pupils are challenged to create three different boxes. A regular sized cereal box, a mini cereal box that is half as tall, half as wide, and half as long as the regular cereal box. A value sized box that is two times as tall, two times as wide, and two times as long as the regular box. We have extended this task to challenge the pupils to also include the package label for the cereal, including nutritional information. We have a task card available for this activity on our website in English. Younger pupils might enjoy a similar challenge using a fairy tale as a stimulus. Perhaps they could be challenged to create a box for Goldilocks to give to the three bears for their porridge. Through this task, pupils can be encouraged to also look at the variety of nutritional labels on breakfast cereals to analyze the different ingredients listed. Pupils will recognize grams and percentages on the label and can be challenged to compare different labels. Exploring the recommended daily allowance and portion sizes can help to develop a simple understanding of food and nutrition and the importance of a balanced diet. If you'd like to extend this task even further, you might like to look at what's in your call at www.stem.org.uk. Data collection activities cover estimation and measurement and also enable many investigations to be performed. What is a typical serving amount? Does bowl diameter affect serving amount? What do pupils eat for breakfast? How healthy are breakfast cereals? While designed for the class setting, these activities can easily be adapted to incorporate the home setting too, as pupils could be challenged to explore their family's breakfast cereals and servings. If you would like to explore this theme in more detail, please see some suggested web links on screen now. I'm now going to hand you back over to Kathleen, who will take you through our next theme, Working in the Kitchen. Thank you, Paul. Before we do that, I might just pop over to Michelle and see if there's any questions from our participants. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, we have lovely questions coming in. And the first question we'd like to discuss is coming in from Aileen. So thank you, Aileen, for your question. And Aileen was wondering if we have any recommendations for home baking activities. I think she was expecting to see us all cooking up a storm in the kitchen here this morning. So thank you, Aileen, for this question. And we have certainly seen some fantastic examples of schools taking part in home baking challenges over the past few weeks. And this really is an engaging and collaborative activity, as you know yourself. So Kathleen will be taking you through the resources from this webinar a little bit later on, and you'll be able to access some task cards in that section. Um, we have included task cards for flapjacks and milkshakes, and we also have some website recommendations which might help you with this request. I think we've all seen enough of banana bread on social media in the last few weeks to last us a lifetime. So hopefully, Aileen, you'll find some ideas in the distance learning page after the webinar. Thank you, Aileen. Thanks, Michelle. So now let's pop ourselves into the kitchen. Young children love working in the kitchen with their family, whether it is baking a cake, sweeping up or splashing in the sink. But there are a lot more opportunities right under our noses. In this section, we will take a look at working in the kitchen, exploring kitchen trails, technology in the kitchen, and sustainability in the kitchen. Similar to the previous poplet, this theme allows teachers to plan for learning experiences, which explore maths and science, skills and contents meaningfully. The kitchen is an opportunity to get children looking at science, technology, engineering and mathematics in their immediate environment. Many teachers are used to creating maths trails around the school. Adding a STEM perspective to a trail will facilitate and highlight to pupils the huge influence STEM has on our everyday life. A well-designed STEM trail offers a unique and engaging learning experience for children. It is an important way of contextualizing STEM and allows children to engage with the environment around them, something which cannot always be achieved with a workshop or book. And where better than their own kitchen? By making use of a familiar environment such as the kitchen, children are challenged to begin to look at it through STEM eyes. 
The choice and variety of questions that the teacher includes on the trail builds on a child's natural desire and curiosity to investigate and learn, while drawing upon and progressing their mathematical and science skills. Each stopping point on the trail should promote inquiry, investigation, problem solving and challenge for the children, while all the time being fun and engaging. The experience and meaningful connect the different strands of the maths and science curriculum while utilising opportunities to examine technology and engineering in a real setting. It offers a wide variety of cross-curricular opportunities and skills development. Younger pupils will need adult assistance to support and facilitate their exploration. However, the child should at all times be encouraged to lead the process and their own learning. When designing a trail for your class, either at school or at home during distance learning, consider the following. Language needs to be clear and easily understood by all pupils. Answers need to be obvious, not ambiguous, with the child feeling confident in their progress. The challenges need to be varied and intriguing for the pupils. The number of tasks should not be excessive. Trails may focus on one strand, on targeted skill development, or they can address a range of content. Pupils should be encouraged to develop their STEM eyes in the environment and be encouraged to subsequently make their own trails. This could lead to the use of digital technology utilizing Google Maps and the creation of printed QR codes. Following the trail, pupils will need to discuss their findings and consider their learning following their active investigations. And remember, enjoyment is essential. A trail is not a trial. In our resource section, we have designed a sample trail for you in both English and Nelga to adjust according to your class context. Considering the different levels of children, level one questions could include, can you tell me about the door you see? What shape is the door? Will it fall down when you open it? Why not? Draw a picture of what happens when we open the door. Extending the challenge for older pupils and those needing additional challenge could include questions such as those on the screen. For more information on developing trails, see our own PDST website under Fieldwork or haveyougotmatseyes.com. Let's take a moment now to reflect on our own confidence in teaching the strand of mathematics. Please answer the following poll. Well, it's interesting to see that both algebra and measures are coming out as challenging strands to teach. Thank you for sharing that with us. So now let's take a look at technology in the homes. What does the T in STEM mean? Take a moment to consider what it means to you. When engaging with STEM activities and projects in the classroom, many people consider technology as a computer related field the digital integration within STEM. However, digital technology is just one aspect of technology. Our national STEM education policy statement states, technology covers a range of fields which involve the application of knowledge, skills, and computational thinking to extend human capabilities and to help satisfy human needs and wants operating at the interface of science and society. Dr. Maeve Liston, Director of Enterprise and Community Engagement at Mary Immaculate College, explains this in her article, Unraveling STEM, Beyond the Acronym of Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. She states, technology is any innovation or device created by people for the purpose of meeting a human need or want. A chair or a paperclip is technology. In STEM classes, students actually create technologies when they produce products and prototypes to solve problems. Often teachers misinterpret the T in STEM. Yes, digital technology can be an element of a STEM activity, but it doesn't always have to be. In designing a product through design and make activities in science, construction activities in art, or engineering activities in STEM, teachers are introducing primary children to the subject of technology through an integrated cross-curricular approach that could be explored later at junior cycle and beyond. Following our kitchen trail, let's now take a closer look at technology in the kitchen. Remember, technology is anything in the kitchen made by humans to solve a problem or to meet a human need or want. 
Begin by encouraging children to go on a technology hunt. What items can they find that are examples of technology? Most likely children will veer towards electronic and digital products in the beginning. If this happens, sharing photos of a number of utensils or appliances could instigate a discussion on, is this a piece of technology? Explain why or why not? And what problem is it addressing? Set the children a task. Choose one piece of technology in your kitchen. Observe it. Describe it. Tease out their understanding of questions such as, what problem does it solve? Are there different parts to your piece of technology? What are the physical properties of your item? Are there any forces included in the design? Do you think this item could be harmful? Will we still use it in 50 years? How would you improve upon it? Children could then draw or annotate the piece of technology on a dual box template with a second drawing of their new and improved design with changes made and labeled. Here in the first drawing, an eight-year-old has drawn a fridge but shown her improvements to include an ice cream dispenser. The second drawing from a 10-year-old is of a sandwich maker, but she notes that sometimes the hard butter doesn't melt. In her improvement section, she, uh, adds a, she has added an outlet to add toppings and a drawer to remove the sandwich so that the toppings can be both on top and inside the sandwich. Anyone for a cheesy belt? This activity can be replicated for any location at home, in school, or in the wider world. A sample task card is included in the resource section of our website. Taking this a step further, encourage the children to engage in a design and make project of an everyday piece of technology to understand the properties and mechanisms of such items. There are lots of suggestions online. Today, let's look at a pedal bin. In this activity, there are four key parts to the process. The children are invited to follow the design and make process to explore, plan, make and evaluate a pedal bin for the kitchen. As with all STEM activities, begin with a problem. Your bin is broken and all the shops are closed due to COVID-19. So you need to design and make a new bin. But bear in mind, you don't want to touch the dirty bin, so we need to find a way to open it without touching it. Begin by exploring an actual pedal bin. If children don't have one at home, perhaps images online or even a short video from teacher opening and closing a bin could assist. Examine how it works. How is the lid opening? What materials are used in creating it? In designing our own bins, what materials could we use that are accessible at home? In taking the time to engage in this step, children are working as engineers, exploring, examining, engaging with the product in front of them. Next, plan the design. Draw the design, list materials needed, explore possible forces such as levers, pulleys, cogs, etc. Encourage annotated drawings or audio explanation of their design during distance learning. The stage of making can be the most fun and most frustrating step of the design and make process as trial and improvement, problem solving, investigating, productive struggle, integrating and connecting all come into play. As the teacher, consider which children may need scaffolding or support and how you can provide that. Criteria might also help in trying to challenge or extend an activity for high achieving pupils, but be careful not to smother creativity by adding too many restrictions. Letting children off to follow their own design and thinking can open our adult eyes to amazing possibilities. Finally, perhaps the most important stage is evaluation and often skipped over due to time pressures. Take time to review the process and reflect on aspects for improvement, mistakes made, and of course, elements they are proud of. This process is key to the success of this activity and can be captured by taking digital photos or video recordings of each stage that includes struggle, research, ongoing reflection and demonstration. The learner may want to engage in this cycle further to refine and develop their concept. If you decide to do this activity, we would love to see pictures of your creations. Feel free to share on Twitter with us at PDST Primary STEM. And following last week's webinar, many of you were interested in the design and make process. For more suggestions of possible design and make projects for the kitchen, see our resource section for this webinar on our website. To extend this unit of work and to challenge children to think creatively, consider the way kitchens are evolving. What smart home technology is infiltrating our kitchens? 
Already there are smart fridges which alert you when certain foods are about to expire. There are smart dishwashers which automatically select the optimum washing temperature, water volume and time based on the individual load. There are intelligent ovens which send a notification to your smartphone when, and only when, it senses the food is properly cooked. All of this could be the basis of a research project for those pupils needing additional challenge with an opportunity to report to the class via a multitude of presentation styles. A STEM project for all pupils could be design a kitchen of the future. A task such as this teaches children about the tentative nature of science and how science is always subject to change. Check back on webinar one when we designed a dream garden. A sample task card is included in the resource section of our website. Having looked at kitchens of the future, let's now look at our own kitchens in the moment and what actions can we take to make our kitchens more sustainable? What is meant by the term sustainable? Sustainability is all about meeting our current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. You may have heard phrases such as sustainable living. Currently, we are using our resources at an unsustainable rate, and this cannot continue into the future. Natural resources on our planet are being used up. Sustainable living is about changing the way we use our resources to provide a secure future for our future generations. The Green Schools program from Antashka is a student-led program promoting long-term whole school action for the environment. Schools engaging in the program and or aspiring for the green flag could look at how to adapt current programs for distance learning. The themes litter and waste, energy and water are all very suitable for the home. For lesson plans, videos, activities and other resources, see greenschoolsireland.org. Remember though, keep health and safety to the forefront of any activity chosen. Other helpful resources include the SEAI Energy Programme, who have an entire primary section that covers each class, while Skullnet have teamed up with developmenteducation.ie to create a sustainability resource section for post-primary, which could still be suitable for senior pupils. To begin this topic, complete a KWL chart on what children already know about sustainability. This could be completed using Padlet, Mentimeter, Seesaw or other online tools. Alternatively, pupils could draw a concept map or a mind map of what they already know and add to this over a unit of work. This can be done by hand or using an app such as mindmup.com, which is free software for creating mind maps. Once children have brainstormed on their understanding of sustainability and shared their thoughts, could they then turn on their STEM eyes and observe the kitchen from a sustainability perspective? Perhaps they could devise an audit to examine actions in their homes, for example, is the kettle filled every time we need one cup of tea? What type of light bulbs are we using? If you want to delve deeper into sustainability, there are many topics suitable for distance learning, from energy efficiency, fair trade products, reusable products in the home, and many more. Today, we are going to look at food waste as possible at a possible topic. In Ireland, there are over 1 million tonnes of food waste disposed of each year. Around one third of this comes from households. Every household in Ireland is responsible for 117 kilos of food waste. The cost per household is between 400 and 1,000 per year. This is a topic that can be explored both at home and in school. It can also allow for some collaborative work as a class, allowing pupils to have a conversation about, do we waste food? So let's complete a lunchtime review. Ask the child to review all the waste from their family lunchtime before it goes in the bin. Can they categorise the rubbish under the following headings? Let's look a little closer at food waste. What is avoidable and unavoidable food waste? And what is a potentially avoidable such as apple cores? Now let's calculate approximately how much food waste is in each household over a day and subsequently over a week. This can be done in two ways. Either they weigh the food waste for lunch and approximately calculate what the waste would be in a day and subsequently in a week. Or if they wish to delve deeper, they could actually measure each meal each day for a week and record their results. Pupils could submit their data to their teacher who could correlate the class findings. An extended challenge to more senior pupils could be to calculate the cost of this food waste using local prices of fruit, bread, etc. See lovefoodhatewaste.co.nz for some nice lesson plans and activities for primary level on their website. 
Moto simig ein vuntor, mis moiena veran over sha, to pachosti agus poster e merla agus e nerga ex stock food waste data e. Kay could yinter an akvan shot the vuntori tias, beg she filuna than a hard rangana, no poshti aveg du shan brasha uhu. Kovmalisha, to alten eureka fui via a huramu, agus genevi aptle del lesh. Food waste might be a little challenging for junior pupils or those with learning needs. So why not return to waste in general, a topic that was most likely already covered in class this year. Green Schools Ireland have a waste audit template that could be adapted for the home. Rather than having children rummage to dirt, possibly dirty bins, offer them a tick list to place over each bin. Every time someone in the house pops something in the bin, they place a tick on the list. The child can then add up the ticks at the end of the day or the end of the week, depending on how long you wish to do the survey for. Could they present their findings on a pictogram? A simple STEAM activity is to create a poster for bin stations in the kitchen, as seen here thanks to our Lady of Mercy NS Sligo. As always, provide the child with a problem. Is anyone still confused with what plastic should go into the recycle bin? Are your parents still confused? Encourage the children to have a conversation with their families about what goes into each bin. They can then make a poster for each bin, gluing real materials to it as an aid for guiding the whole family in making correct choices. As with all activities, consider the age range and ability of your pupils and how you can differentiate for learning needs. To end this topic, perhaps encourage pupils to send their top tips for sustainability in the kitchen back to teacher. These could then be collated as a class advice sheet and shared with families. For further information, see the following sources. Now, over to you, Paul, to have a listen to what happens when we delve into liquids and change. Thanks very much, Kathleen. But I think before we start into liquids and change, we might go back over to Michelle for another question. I know there's a good number of questions coming in this morning, Michelle, and you're all doing your best to get to as many as you can. We are, and the selection of the question to highlight is actually probably the most challenging part. Thank you, Paul. We have a question in from Philip who says that he loves the idea of the pedal bin for a design and make, but he was wondering if we had any other ideas that would be more suited to the junior end of the school. So that's a great question. I think, Kathleen, you, you have already highlighted that we have additional design and make activities in our distant learning page for this webinar resource list. So also, Philip, if you're familiar with our e-bulletin, STEM Smuinta, they have a really nice design and make activity where children are challenged to make a chair for Baby Bear. So that would be a lovely one for the junior classes. And in the science section of our website, we have a list of suggested activities and design and make tasks for each strand of the science curriculum. And the tasks are available for all class groupings. So if you're looking for something specific in terms of the curriculum and not so much the kitchen, you'll find a wealth of suggestions here. So I hope that you find that helpful, Philip, and thanks for such a great question. Over to you, Paul. That's great. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, so our third and final theme for this morning's webinar is liquids and change. In this section, we will explore this theme in a number of different ways. Firstly, as with all of the other themes so far, we will take some time at the beginning to consider the cross-curricular links of the theme alongside the potential skill development in maths, science and STEM. Following this, we will explore three liquid-based STEM activities, which demonstrate the potential learning both at home and in school in this area. We will then look at how each task can be modified to suit pupils of all ages and abilities. As you can see, the three activities which we have chosen for today are absorbing water, density tower, and ice escape. Finally, at the end of this section of the webinar, we will provide you again with some web links where you can take the time to explore the theme of liquids and change further. Similar to the previous poplets you've seen today, this theme allows for teachers to plan for learning experiences which explore maths and science skills alongside content meaningfully. Please take a moment now to consider these suggested integrated strands and skills for the theme of liquids and change. Our first activity in the theme of liquids and change is called absorbing water. Spills are often an unwelcome feature of every kitchen in every home, whether it's the morning milk spilling over the side of the cereal bowl, 
the knocked over cup of orange juice or a glass of water placed too close to the edge of the table. We tend to instinctively reach for the kitchen paper when this happens. But perhaps there is an opportunity to engage with some inquiry based learning here. Children are often fascinated by the way in which kitchen paper changes in appearance and weight as it starts to absorb the liquid that it has been placed on. Why not take the time to explore this further? This wonderful task card you can see is available from Discover Primary Science and Maths. We have included a link to this resource in our sec a resource section of our website for your use after this webinar. Also included is a very helpful additional resource for this activity, outlining the ways in which maths can be meaningfully integrated throughout. To begin this activity with children, perhaps you could pose the question, what other types of paper do we have at home? I wonder if they could clean up spills just like the kitchen paper. For this investigation, we recommend spending some time on the importance of fair testing. Fair testing is essential in an investigation such as this. Each time we carry out a different investigation, we will only change one thing each time. This is called our variable. For this particular task, as we are investigating if other paper types absorb as well as kitchen paper, we are going to be changing the paper each time, which means all other aspects of this test must be equal and remain the same throughout. They are called constants. Perhaps the children, depending on their age and ability, can consider for themselves what these constants should be. What, liquids, what liquid are we going to use? Does the liquid have to be the same for each piece of paper? Should we have the same amount of each liquid each time? How will we make sure to test each piece of paper for the same amount of time? What size will the piece of kitchen paper be? And should all of the pieces of different types of paper be the same size as this? Through this conversation, children begin to realize the importance of fair testing and can take the time to plan and prepare the materials they'll be using. As you will see in the following video, uh, the child could use a ruler to measure strips of equal size for each type of paper. The child in, in the upcoming video made sure to use the same glass jar for each test as well, as well as deciding that she would use the measuring jug found in her own kitchen to make sure that each glass had exactly 100 milliliters of water and five milliliters of green food dye. Finally, she decided that she would leave each piece of paper for one minute before removing it to compare with all other pieces. At this stage of the investigation, perhaps the child could use their skills of prediction to explain what they think is going to happen. Will the kitchen paper work the best? How will we know which piece of paper is the most absorbent? Which piece of paper do you think will absorb the least amount of water? Perhaps now, as you watch this video, you might like to make a prediction yourself about which type of paper will absorb the most. An important part of this investigation is to ask the child how they are going to record and communicate their results. Will they explain it aloud using their own words? Perhaps a table or a chart might be used. As you, as you can see, um, this child decided to lay the pieces of paper side by side to illustrate her results, creating a bar chart and a, a nice meaningful integration with maths. Maybe this activity could be extended 
depending on the child's interest, age and ability to investigate other liquids, such as orange juice, washing up liquid or milk. Which paper absorbs the most with these liquids? Is it the same type of paper that was best for water? Was there anything that surprised you? Another great extension of this activity can be to explore ex absorption through multiple colours. Perhaps children might wish to carry out the walking water exploration using the paper that they found to be the best at absorbing in the initial investigation. As simply put, this involves setting up an odd number of containers, three containers, five containers, seven containers, etc., um, whichever suits best, and placing water in every second one. Then, a few drops of food dye can be added to each container with the water, as can be seen in this picture. Finally, some kitchen paper can be folded and placed carefully to connect each container to the next. Once again, maybe you can invite the children at this stage to share their predictions. What do you think will happen? What will the empty containers look like at the end of this investigation? I wonder what would happen if we didn't organize the containers in a straight line and instead made a circle. Here is a sample result very kindly shared with us during the week in the lead up to today's webinar. More questions could include, is there anything that surprised you? What would you change if you carried out this investigation again? Would this work with the other paper types that we explored in our first task? This activity and many others are available for you on the resources page at our website to use either during distance learning or indeed back in the classroom when we all return to school. The second task for today in the theme of liquids and change is called Density Tower and as its name suggests, explores the density of liquids. I'm sure I don't just speak for myself when I say how amazed I was the very first time I saw oil and water separated in a container. It sparked a, a natural curiosity in me, wondering why these two liquids did not mix in the same way as orange concentrate and water did. Perhaps children might see the oil and water and wonder, why do some liquids mix together and others don't? What would happen if I stirred them with a spoon? Are there any more liquids available in the kitchen that don't mix? This allows for some excellent inquiry-based investigations in the kitchen. Keeping safety in mind at all times, of course, you might ask the children, what liquids could we try? What will we use as our container? And how much of each liquid should we use? Children may select a range of liquids commonly found in the kitchen, such as washing up liquid, water, milk, olive oil, hand soap, vinegar, etc. for this investigation. A transparent container such as a jam jar or a glass is probably the best choice as container uh, for this activity. But once again, why not encourage the children to consider for themselves which container would be best? Would a bowl allow us to see whether the liquids have mixed? Would a coffee mug be suitable for this task? This activity, of course, can be as guided or as open as you wish it to be. Depending on their age and ability, children may wish to freely, or they may, be, they may be allowed to freely and openly explore the combination of various liquids, whereas some children might need assistance and support from an adult. It is important, as in the previous task, to encourage children to determine how they are going to record the results of this investigation. Would a table or a chart work for this task? Could they take photographs using digital technology? Are they going to sketch what they see? One essential thing to consider at this point is also how the liquids involved in the investigation are going to be responsibly disposed of. Uh, for example, making sure to avoid pouring used oil down the kitchen sink. Following their investigation using multiple combinations of two different liquids, perhaps some children could be challenged to use their findings and recordings to create a density tower like the one seen in this photograph. Food colouring can be used in this instance to help children to see the different layers of liquid in their tower. How many liquids can you have in your tower before they start to mix? How are you going to add each liquid? Which liquid goes on the bottom? NUI Galway have designed a wonderful resource, Kitchen Chemistry, which teachers can use both in the classroom and now during this period of distance learning. This particular activity can be found on page 28 of this teacher resource book under the title Sink or Swim, where there are a number of extension activities and tasks included to further explore the concept of density. This resource is well worth a visit and is hosted on Skullnet for your use in the future. 
A link to it will be included on the resource section of our website following this morning's broadcast, as well as in the web links section at the end of this uh, part of the webinar. A popular extension activity, uh, once again, um, for exploring the density of liquids is the design and make task of creating your own lava lamp. Once again, our friends at Discover Primary Science and Maths have provided a wonderful task card that could be used in school or at home to guide teachers, parents, and students through various elements of this activity. Perhaps some additional inquiry though could be included here. How effective is the lava lamp if we change some of the quantities of liquids? How long will the lamp continue to work for? One day, one week, will it work forever? Can we make the, liquid, the liquids in our lava lamp luminous? These questions allow for a rich learning experience in the home or in school, where children are encouraged to use their learning from the initial density task by applying it to explore various liquid combinations in their lava lamps. A further extension of the density tower activity can be found in our PDST measures manual, which can be found in the STEM section of our PDST website. This extension task introduces the idea of adding solid objects to the density tower and exploring how they interact with the liquids. Our third and final activity in the theme of liquids and change is called ice escape. Water and its different states is something that engages children, whether it's thinking about adding an ice cube to a cool drink on a summer's day or watching the steam shoot out of the kettle when it is boiled. One interesting element to think of when considering the different states of liquid, in this instance water, is the idea of reversible and irreversible changes. Engaging a child in this discussion can help to identify and explore any existing misconceptions in this area. As you can see here, water through freezing can become ice and through thawing can once again return to water. This is a reversible change and one that a lot of children can explore safely and easily. Ask the child to think of other reversible changes that they, they know of with water. Are there any more? What about steam? Can we reverse the change when we mix water with orange concentrate? Can we separate the water and concentrate from each other easily? This may lead to the child recognizing that this is an irreversible change and encourages them, encourages them to think about other irreversible changes that they know of. Is the water in a cup of tea reversible or irreversible? Is the oil and water from activity one reversible, sorry, from the density activity reversible or irreversible? For this activity, we are going to be looking at the reversible change in the state of water from water to ice and back to water once again. This activity begins with the child taking a small object, such as a Lego minifigure or even a Unifix cube, and submerging it in water in a small container or cup. Place the container in the freezer and invite the child to predict what they think will happen to their minifigure. Will it freeze? Will it be easy to remove from the ice? As the water is on the verge of freezing, it is important to remember to push the minifigure towards the center of the container so that it is fully surrounded by the ice. However, depending on the child's age and ability, perhaps having only part of the minifigure submerged might be more suitable for them. While the water is freezing, challenge the children to suggest ways in which they can go about rescuing their minifigure from the block of ice. Before suggesting possible options, encourage them to share their thinking. Perhaps we could use warm water. What did, the, what did the local council put on the ground the last time it was icy? Would sugar work? Is there anything else in the kitchen that you think might help? What about the radiator? Can we use toothpicks or spoons to help to rescue him? The children can also engage in some rich skill development while waiting for the water to freeze. How long will we have to wait before we can start the rescue? How long do you predict it will take to free the minifigure from the ice? How much salt do you think you need? Is one spoonful enough? Too little? Too much? Perhaps they could explore how long they can keep the ice from melting instead. One final thing for children to consider before beginning their rescue is how they will record their findings. Perhaps they have encased several minifigures in the ice and would like to try a different method on each one to determine which is the most efficient. Would a table or chart be useful? 
Maybe this is an opportunity again to bring in some digital technology. Could they make a short photo story or Adobe Spark to showcase their work and communicate their results? We will now watch one such video made by a fourth class student using Windows Movie Maker of her experience working through this task at home in her own kitchen. As you watch this video, we would like you to consider the following questions. Number one, is this girl developing any mathematical, scientific or STEM skills as she works through the task? And number two, what criteria, guidance or conditions would you include with this task for your class, whether it is in the classroom or during distance learning? As you saw in this video, this student attempted to use a couple of different methods to rescue her minifigure. Firstly, she tried to use salt, which worked, but at a slower pace than she liked. She then used some warm water, which worked a lot quicker. One possible aspect which you might consider, depending on the age and ability of the child, is integrating some key maths skills and thinking into this activity. Perhaps the goal is to extract the Lego man while causing as little damage as possible to the ice. Maybe the child could weigh the block of ice when they remove it from the freezer and weigh it once again when they remove the minifigure, aiming to have the lowest possible difference in weight. Perhaps there could be a time limit on the extraction. Is it possible to get him out in five minutes, two minutes, one minute? These of course are just some suggestions, but there are many such criteria that you might consider if setting this task, particularly for children in an older class. Here you can see some web links some of which we have mentioned earlier, where you might wish to explore the theme of liquids and change further. So now that we've taken the time to explore a range of STEM activities across our three themes, we feel that it is important to consider what links all of this together. Of course, the children are developing their science, maths and STEM, STEM skills through these activities, alongside their engagement with strands and strand units of the curriculum, but is there more than this? We suggest taking some time before, during, or after each of these activities to open a discussion with the child about the nature of science. Ask the child, how are you working like a scientist today? Maybe you can scaffold this discussion for them with some follow-up questions. Were you testing your ideas? Were you asking questions? Were you recording information? And also, how are you recording it? This rich discussion encourages the child to consider the work of a scientist and to recognize how they have engaged in this work in a meaningful way through whichever tasks and themes they have worked on. So we will now head back over to Michelle for one final question from the Q&A before Kathleen takes us through the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we had a very interesting question in from Gina, who was just asking again about the kitchen chemistry resource that you alluded to, Paul. And she was wondering if we could remind her where she can access this and what age group it is suitable for. So thank you for that, Gina. And to be honest, I myself only became familiar with this resource of late, and I'm glad you asked this question. The Kitchen Chemistry Programme was established by the School of Chemistry at NUI Galway and it aims to promote chemistry for young children and show them just how much fun it can be. And the programme itself also offers school visits and please God when things go back to some level of normality again this might be something you would like to avail of. In terms of where you can access the resource, we have highlighted a link to Skullnet in our web resource section for this webinar. And here you'll find a number of videos in English and Irish from the Kitchen Chemistry Programme. 
the teachers resource pack itself has a fabulous array of activities and to answer your question regarding age group each task has been differentiated for three different groups early years middle and upper classes so this makes it accessible for all and it's definitely worthwhile checking it out so head on over to our friends in Skullnet to have a look at that resource after thank you Gina thank you Michelle we might now just take a moment to recap uh, on the key messages of our webinar before we conclude. And I want you to consider your own teaching and learning experiences in STEM as you read them. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many supports have arisen online for distance learning. On our own Twitter page at PDST Primary STEM, we share resources daily from the many partners in STEM. We take a theme for maths and a theme for science each week and share an activity a day to support teachers in designing practical activities for learning at home, such as this one on marvellous milkshakes and this one on designing a chair in the kitchen for baby bear. Twitter can be an excellent platform for developing learning communities. Many schools now have an account and share the work of their pupils, offering further lesson ideas for us all to choose from. Here we have fifth class in Skull Wiragon Small, Cray County Mayo, sharing their density experiments as mentioned by Paul earlier. We also have St. Michael's Infant School in Limerick, integrating healthy eating with maths in this activity. St. Clair's NS in Harold's Cross, Dublin, shares one of the many brilliant entries they had to their own home cooking challenge, hashtag cookoff2020. And finally, second class in St. Peter and Paul's JNS in Balbriggan tested ice cubes at home. These are just a snippet of the many ideas and practices that are shared on this social media platform. Follow us at PDST Primary STEM and the greater PDST organization at PDST IE. Throughout these unprecedented times, PDST continues to support teacher professional learning remotely through direct school support, live webinars, and in developing a large range of online resources to support distance learning. As you can see from our website, we have an entire section devoted to distance learning, along with an additional section that gives you access to all the webinars in the Learning for All series, in conjunction with the Teaching Council. PDST has also worked with Skullnet to produce a huge number of learning paths and other resources free for teachers to access. Our own team has developed specific resources for science, maths and STEM to support teachers in facilitating distance learning. This includes our fortnightly e-bulletin STEM Swinche, teacher manuals in Merla Agus Inelga, learning paths for maths and a lovely section on potential STEM learning experiences at home. Check it out at the link here. Following today's webinar, we have a specific section for this webinar series. It will include a recording of today's webinar for you to peruse at your leisure, along with a bank of resources to support today's topics. This will include web links, templates and activity cards. Feel free to share these supports with your colleagues. Let's now take a little look at where our resources are all stored on our own website. This link, PDST Primary STEM, will bring you here where you see the array of distance learning supports we offer. Here at the very top is where our STEM Sawalia supports will be, including the recording from today's uh, webinar. If we go and have a little look here at STEM Swinche, this fortnight's particular edition is very suitable to the kitchen as it focuses on materials and weight. As you can see, there are activities for every age group with a particular focus that could support further activities in the kitchen, such as this one in third and fourth class on bags of weight, or this one on materials detective, which integrates nicely with the technology we discussed earlier. This activity for no cook Play-Doh recipe would be suitable for all ages, and always is included a design and make challenge such as this. So folks, that brings us to the end of our second uh, webinar in the primary STEM series, STEM in the Kitchen. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we have and that you have one or two resources to take away with you to support your distance teaching over the next few weeks. Thanks to all of our team for their work in designing today's webinar and a particular thanks to Siobhan, Dennis, Trina and Michelle working behind the scenes today. We would appreciate your feedback to guide next week's webinar, so please do complete the evaluation form 
at the end of this showing. If you have enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will join us again next Wednesday where Paul and Michelle will be having a lot of fun sharing some resources and ideas to support distance learning through play. Webinar three, STEM and Play, is open now for anyone wishing to register. Until next time, Sloan August Banachts.